in their in their lives. Um, but also reflecting kind of what are some of the struggles and what are some of the, the challenges that they face in their life to get to where they are today. Um, then we go out into communities and we share the stories far and wide. We do that online and on the ground, like we're doing here today online with all of you uh, through through We Rise. Um, uh, so far, the It Gets Better project has collected, has uh, amassed a huge portfolio of, uh, of video stories. We have over 70,000 in our collection. Together, this represents the world's largest storytelling effort for the empowerment of LGBTQ plus youth. You can learn all about these stories at itgetsbetter.org. Um, you can watch some there and we're always posting new ones to social media as well. So please make sure to, to follow us. Today, I'm uh, Nandi and Sam and I are gonna be sharing three stories from a very special series that uh, the It Gets Better Project had the privilege to collaborate on called Fearless. Um, we partner with MSNBC as well as another LA County based nonprofit organization called One Archives to document the experiences of some really, really amazing pioneers from the LGBTQ equality movement here in Los Angeles. Um, Again, like I've mentioned already, the, these video stories feature some of their struggles, some of the challenges that they face, but also the ways that they've absolutely thrived in building a better world here in Los Angeles for their community. Um, we're gonna start um, by sharing one incredible story from this series from Mia Yamamoto. Uh, Mia Yamamoto is a criminal defense attorney um, who works here in, in Los Angeles. Um, and in this video, she reflects on how coming out impacted her life and career and why being trans for her is more in your face than being gay. And of course, she shares some beautiful messages for LGBTQ youth. So uh, Nandi and Sam, let's sit back and watch the video with the rest of the audience. And then afterwards, we're gonna follow it with some uh, discussion as well as we'll take some uh, questions from, the, from those that are watching from the audience. So let's get started. Being transgender is, is much more in your face than being gay. Tomorrow, you'll look the same, uh, you'll dress the same, you'll probably groom yourself the same. But when you're transgender, you'll come and you'll look different and you'll groom yourself differently and you'll call yourself a different name and you'll have to use different pronouns. And it is a larger challenge in some ways to come out and the coming out process, again, a constant ongoing process. I was born in uh, the post and relocation camp um, where they sent the Japanese uh, during the World War II. Went in the army, uh, I volunteered for Vietnam, um, served uh, in Vietnam from 1967, 68 with the 4th Infantry Division, came back, um, survived, went to UCLA Law School and uh, started my career as a lawyer. I always wanted to be a poverty lawyer. I always felt that uh, working for the poor was was my calling. Uh, I always felt that they, they got a, a they got a bad uh, deal. Being a transgender person is certainly um, not a majority of the community. Certainly being Japanese American uh, helped in terms of being used to discrimination. And even in a way, being a Vietnam veteran in 1968 was a time which was um, where we were singled out for, for hostility and abuse. And uh, I can't say that um, it has been fun or pleasant, but it certainly has been a great experience for somebody who needs to be an activist, who wants to act actively engage and advocate on behalf of marginalized and oppressed communities. Well, coming out at work was the, the most interesting experience because I certainly remember um, my anticipation. Uh, I figured um, from what I had seen again in therapy and seen in the jails and seen on the streets that what I would get would be rejection, revulsion, and ridicule. Um, and so I sort of planned it all out. I thought, okay, I'm gonna do this thing no matter what, um, but um, when I do, I'm gonna be ready for the bigots and the haters, and I'm gonna have all these snappy comebacks and everything else. And uh, so I show up in court. After 30 years as a trial lawyer, um, as Mike, I come out as Mia, and I, I walk into court, and just in a dress and heels, and um, no makeup yet, <laughs> not the first time. And I walk in with my client, and uh, it was really interesting. I get to see people's eyes popping out and, uh, you know, jaws dropping and other things that uh, I certainly expected. They did a front page article on the Daily Journal, which is the daily uh, legal newspaper. And um, 
I got to explain myself and talk about what I was going to do. Once the article came out, that was like the greatest thing for my coming out because I didn't have to notify 50,000 people about what I was doing and why. I was in court with, with one judge who, um, it was a death penalty case, and I wanted to make sure that there would be no prejudice to my client if I continued um, after the article came out. And the, the judge came out, did what he was going to do, and then he's about to go off. I said, hey, judge, I wrote you a letter, and I have to get some, I have to get a ruling on this. I have to make sure that my client is, is going to get the same due process as anybody else, despite the fact that his lawyer is a transgender woman. And he said, no, I, I read the article, he said, and, uh, you know, I feel you'll do a fine job. And um, he said, I read the part where you said that you couldn't feel as though you'd lived unless you could die as a woman. And he says, that choked me up. And he, and he stopped for a second and tears came to his eyes. This judge is the hanging judge of Los Angeles. He was, he's retired now, but he was considered the meanest, most vicious judge in the criminal courts building. And when he said that, and when he started to tear up, my, my client's jaw dropped and I was stunned. I looked back at the row of lawyers behind me and they were stunned. Their eyes were popping out, their jaws were dropped. They couldn't believe they saw what they saw. He got off the bench and he had to go back to his chambers to compose himself. Um, and I remember thinking that if even he reacts that way to my transition, then um, then then it, it couldn't be a bad thing. It couldn't, there's, there's nothing negative that I could say about what happened that in those courts or any of those places. I would actually walk into court and people would be lined up to give me a hug and a kiss and to congratulate me. Um, with the women, it was like, welcome to the club. With my guy friends, it was always like, I got your back, homie. Um, the judges would actually come down off the bench in their robes to give me a hug and a kiss and uh, to welcome me and to congratulate me. Um, I was moved to tears by how little I'd expected of my colleagues. And it's my experience too that transgender people know who they are usually by five or six years old and there's no going back and there's no vacillation and there's no wavering. Ever since I can remember I always considered myself a girl. I knew I was different and I had to express that to my parents. When they are that young they know who they are and they haven't had the forces of the world that have been placed upon people my age of my generation to conform. It's given me a vision of the future that for these kids, these kids that are in these schools right now and that are growing up, are growing up in a society that's getting better and that we can help make it better. It's just really a question of, of finding yourself because once you can do that, once you have embraced your own authenticity, there's, there's no limit to what you can do. You have to find the courage to be real, find the courage to be honest, and, and once you do, there is a place for you. If I can do what I'm doing, um, and making a living and supporting myself and the causes that I support, then, then anybody could do it. Oh, I absolutely love that video. Mia is such an incredible person. Um, what's something that stood out from the, the video to both of you? Sam, would you, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. I definitely connected with when she said, obviously I'm a trans man, she's a trans woman, but in the matter of I don't want to die as someone I'm not. Mm. And mm -hmm. that was very, very powerful considering when I was 10 years old, I told my mother, I don't think I'm going to, I'm not going to live to be an adult unless I'm, unless I'm going to grow up to be a boy. And so mm. that, that hit really hard. Um, knowing what that feels like and being prepared for negativity and to not have, supportive peers or friends or colleagues around you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, thankfully you, you had a parent that was willing to listen. Thankfully Mia had colleagues and judges who were, who were willing to embrace her for, for who she is. I think that's just such an important piece and so important to 
the, the mental health and wellness of LGBTQ people is that they have allies and they have someone that's there to support them in their coming out process and to just hold their hand through the journey. Um, Nandi, what about you? What was something that kind of stood out or, or struck you from, from the video? Yeah, I think what stood out to me was when um, she was talking about just the overwhelming support that she was getting uh, from her colleagues and from her judges. And I think um, it's absolutely imperative, especially when uh, people are working in law um, that, you know, we can see that, hey, someone can be from my community and work in this career field. And if, like mm -hmm. she said in the end of the video, like if I can do it, then you can too. And I think that's really inspiring um, to see people and not only just um, or uh, in, who, who are practicing law or uh, who are judges, but even like law enforcement um, and just like just all pinnacles of working for the government. I think it's very, very uh, refreshing to see people of our community openly who are um, working for the government and you know doing things in their power uh to ensure that you know there's justice and that people are fighting for the right things and um you know um i just think that that's really really inspiring and i think that's what stood out to me is when she got all of that support um from those mm -hmm. judges uh because it's very um unfortunately it's very common for people um and i'm not one to stereotype but it is more common than not to see people in law enforcement or people who do work for the government who are not so vocal um, in supporting mm -hmm. LGBTQ people and they kind of just like let it slide or they kind of just don't really talk about it or they avoid it. And I think it's really good to see people openly supporting um, Mia. Right. And I just, I just found that to be uh, the highlight of her journey. 100%. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that policies such as don't ask, don't tell existed within the US military, right? Where sure, you can be who you are, just don't ever talk about it. Don't come out to your colleagues. Don't be who you are in an open and honest way. And I'm so glad that at least in some spaces, that's no longer our, our story. That's no longer our history, but it still is a reality for people all across this country. Um, yes, people can get married, but in many, uh, many queer people can get married today. Um, but in many states, they can get married on Sunday and fired on Monday, specifically because mm -hmm. of their queer identity. And it's so important to realize that that doesn't need to happen. Everybody should have the opportunity like Mia to come out and be proud and be who they are in, in the profession that they love. Um, something that also stood out to me from the story was, um, the fact that Mia was born uh, in a Japanese internment camp, um, which is very similar to George Takei's story, um, an another LGBTQ icon. Um, and Mia mentioned that, like mentioned that it wasn't just about being a trans woman, it was also about being a Vietnam vet. Um, it was also about being a Japanese American, like three different identities that often put her um, at odds with, with some people um, and, and their beliefs and what they think is, is right or okay with, with other people. Um, that was just something that really stood out to me. Um, we have some prepared questions that we're, we're going to display here on the screen to kind of help us along. Um, the first one is, in what way does Mia feel that her experiences early in life prepared her for being a lawyer and out as transgender? Have you had any experiences that have helped you be your most authentic self? So let's do that first part of the, the, the question. Um, what experiences in Mia's life kind of prepared her to come out uh, as, as a transgender and, and as a lawyer? Um, Sam, would you like to comment on that? Uh, sure. I, coming back to the point you made earlier, Mm -hmm. of the fact that she was born in an internment camp and she's a Japanese American, that there was those, um, I don't want to say- Those challenges. Discriminating aspects, but yes, mm -hmm. yes, those challenges. And I feel that because that happened in her life, mm -hmm. she, maybe that helped when she came out as trans, just having that in her life and knowing how to deal with it and how to be strong and how to overcome obstacles like that. 100%. Have, have you had any similar experiences? Kind of go to that second part, any experiences that have helped you just 
find that bravery and that courage, just be your 100% most authentic self? Yes. Uh, in my earlier years of transition, I always remember people would ask me, mm. why do you want to be a boy? Or why won't you just be a girl? And I just remember saying, in my heart, that's not who I am. Mm. And as I continued in the community, um, I don't remember who said it, but this phrase was said to me and it just, it sticks with me to today still. It's sexual orientation is who you go to bed um, with and gender identity is who you go to bed as and that mm everyone just kept telling me, oh, you must be a lesbian and that's okay. And I said, it has nothing to do with who I want to go to bed with or who I'm attracted to. It's who I feel I am in my heart. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, Nani, maybe the second question can, can be for you that's going to come up for, for, for Mia. Um, is that what makes coming out a constant ongoing process for queer people, as, as Mia says? Um, how might gender, race, socioeconomic status, or other factors influence someone's coming out process? What, were, what would be your thoughts on that, Nandi? Yeah, I think, um, I think all of those things definitely uh, play a role in the process of one's coming out. Um, I know definitely that race, um, I think, I think race and gender are the two biggest ones that have to do mm. with it. I feel like with, um, you know, with men, because gender roles unfortunately exist and society is expected to follow them and to live by them. Um, I feel like it puts so much pressure on men. Um, and then to like, you know, with toxic masculinity that exists and with men who are gay or men who present as flamboyant or men who present as like more feminine, um, it's harder for them to be able to really come out and be in their skin. And then too, if you look at a man who is coming out um, as queer or LGBTQ and um, they're in a marginalized, uh, you know, community, like say they're, they might be Latino or they might be black or they might be Asian Pacific Islander and then they have to kind of deal with that too because there are factors um, within those marginalized communities that uh, that already you know that already exist alone um, mm -hmm. so they're you know and I think it goes back to intersectionality um, and it talks it just talks about how you know someone can have all of these uh, you know marginalized identities for me for example you know I'm a black lesbian woman and so even if i wasn't gay i would still have to deal with being a black woman and even though and even if i wasn't mm -hmm. a woman i would still have to deal with being black so right. i think with those things it definitely influences um a person's coming out um because there is just so much pressure from all of the other issues that we have to deal with when you're a part of a marginalized community multiple marginalized communities um so I think sometimes it can be harder because our voices are already um, muffled as is. And so, yeah. you know, it's like when we are saying, oh, well, here's the other thing about me that probably is gonna like, you right. know, like ruin my relationships with other people or something like that, you know, it doesn't make it any better. And so I think when people of color come out or, or when people with disabilities come out or people who have other marginalized identities come out, it's um there's so much more pressure and um mm -hmm. i feel like there's just so much pressure to um you know just being anxious about dealing with the backlash from that um because some people sure. can still be a part of the community but some people can be more accepted than others so mm -hmm. i i totally understand what you're saying i have a really close friend who who he's a black gay man and in the process of coming out he often had people say, well, are you black or are you gay? As if he had to be one or the mm -hmm. other. And he said that his answer was always, yes, like I am both. 
and being gay doesn't take away from my blackness and being black does mm-hmm. not take away from my gayness. I am both, I am both all the time. Um, and right. just hearing people's stories and hear people like Mia come out and talk about those intersecting identities, I think is really, really important. Um, I grew up in a very, very religious conservative community. I grew up Mormon um, and I did not come out until well into my twenties because I never saw people from my community. Mm. I never saw people from the faith that I grew up in coming out and being themselves. It wasn't until I did. It wasn't until I saw someone else from that community come out and be authentically themselves that I felt that I had the courage to do the same thing. So Mm. it's interesting that not only do these intersecting identities impact someone's own personal coming out, but it impacts everyone to follow. And sometimes there needs to be those courageous individuals that kind of (laughs) uh, take on that journey first. when and the rest of us are just waiting to 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 follow along um do you and either of you have any lingering thoughts or any final conclusions you'd like to share about mia's story or about these particular questions sam would you like to say anything um i definitely feel that in comparison to mia our generation such as nandi and i we are in a very different place and we're we're Mm. it's not easy but we have a lot more privilege is not the word i'm looking for um Mm -hmm. but a lot more a lot more supportive of the community and a lot Mm -hmm. more opportunities to come out and we have a lot more resources to be supported which Mm -hmm. can make coming out or slowly coming out, it can make the entire process easier than I'm sure it was during Mia's time. For sure. 100%. And for those of you that are watching, if if you're thinking about these very questions, if you're thinking about coming out and it's causing you some kind of mental anguish, please reach out to others and find support. If you go to the It Gets Better Project's website, you go to itgetsbetter.org slash get help, you can find organizations all over the country that are providing support to LGBTQ youth and to the LGBTQ community in general. So definitely if anybody's considering coming out and kind of starting in that journey themselves, um, there are resources and there is a community out there that loves you and is, and is ready to help you along. You don't have to do it alone. Uh, well, that's a great segue to our next story. Um, which is actually going to come from uh, another activist here in the Los Angeles area, Joey Terrell. Um, Joey Terrell is uh, an artist um, and he incorporates into his art, his experiences being queer, being Hispanic, um, being HIV positive. um, And he's found it uh, an opportunity, not only only is it cathartic to kind of explore his identities through his art, um, but it's empowering for for himself and for the rest of of, of his community. Um, so again, let's sit back and enjoy Joey's story, and afterwards we'll have another small discussion. Part, Part of the, 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 the idea, idea of being a Chicano artist and to create your images that reflect yourself or your culture is the fact that you know we, we're sort of erased. Back in the day in the 70s, you didn't see Latino images on TV. You certainly didn't see gay images on TV, and you certainly didn't see gay Latino images on TV. So to me, I needed to paint myself. The first house that I grew up in as a, as a child was in Santa Fe Springs, or Los Nietos, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. and. Um, you know, as far back as I can remember, in terms of coming out and understanding that I was different, I don't remember a time when I didn't feel different. I moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, my dad was a, um, a Marine uh, from World War II, and um, he was very loving. He was also an artist, so I grew up with him always creating or making art or furniture, and I just sort of followed in those footsteps. So I was getting harassed at school, you know, thrown up against the locker, um, the way I was dressing because my dressing was kind of reflecting, you know, the the clubs and the kids that I was hanging out with, uh, which veered towards Glitter Rock and David Bowie. And 
So there was a clash. And, uh, but in my junior year in high school, um, I came out to uh, classmates and essentially um, made a stance that, you know what, this is who I am. And uh, I, to my surprise, I ended up gaining some respect from some of the very guys that used to be my torturers. Um, my, uh, a good friend of mine from high school, Terry, um, we both came out together at the same time. You know, for me at that time, it was like just to meet other queer teens was fantastic. And some of the conversations back then among the youth was discussing whether or not we thought of ourselves as mentally ill. I mean, that was, that was one of the conversations I remember thinking and I thought to myself, oh God, no, 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 we are definitely not mentally ill. I started to meet a, a circle of friends that uh, we then would go out, you know, and uh, socialize. So we'd go to clubs and bars in um, West Hollywood uh, and Hollywood. It was about the music, the dancing, the socializing. Then in, uh, you know, the gay pride marches, like I think in 74 uh, or 75, I, I made t-shirts up that said faggot. Dyke, uh, for, for my cousin and her partner, Dyke and lesbian. And we marched um, in this contingent uh, and, you know, our t-shirts were a hit. And uh, that led to me and Teddy Sandoval collaborating on an art piece uh, that we called our Maricon series, where um, I was the model and I made these t-shirts that just said Maricon and he did this series of photographs and it was like a photo fashion photo shoot. And then that led into me making Maricon t-shirts for the next Gay Pride March. My work was always uh, involved with painting myself, my lovers, boyfriends, friends, um, including, you know, all the, uh, the heartbreak that's involved. And then eventually, since my work was autobiographical, uh, HIV naturally just played a role in it uh, as uh, I started to have friends uh, get sick and die, um, and, uh, and then my own HIV status as well. I was infected in New York in 1980. Didn't know it at the time, but I was. But coming back to Los Angeles, I was uh, thinking that, well, it seems like HIV only affects white men. <clears throat> so maybe it's not gonna affect Latinos. Well, I learned very quickly. One of the series I've done the last 10 years has been the uh, Still Life series, sort of based on the pop art Still Lifes of the 1960s. And, uh, but these are all Still Lifes with HIV medications. So on the breakfast table, along with the Cheerios and Coca-Cola is uh, you know, uh, Zared or Kurtzavan or whatever the drugs were at the time. The support that I got from the communities did instill in me this confidence about um, asserting who I am and um, you know and taking my cue from listening to what I considered the elders in the community um, it really inspired in me the attitude that you know I I am deserving of respect and um, and that was also something that I um, had gotten from my parents so <clears throat> within you know being Mexican-American or Chicano uh, growing up um, I realized uh, very early on that there was this difference and this sort of prejudicial attitude towards Chicanos or Mexicans in, in LA. And uh, so my asserting myself and my identity uh, ethnically, uh, for me, naturally segued into asserting my uh, validation uh, with my orientation. So the two overlapped, intersected, and sometimes conflicted. And that uh, ended up being a, a strategy for my art making uh, as an artist. It was more about this is my experience that I'm showing you, the world. Another great video. Um, I love that uh, uh, Joey mentions that he looked up to pioneers that came before him and now he gets to be a pioneer 
uh, for communities today. Um, again, I'd love to know your your general Im impressions and and ideas about the uh, the video. Um, Joey's an artist, and Nandi, you're an artist. Um, I, so maybe let's go first with you. What are what are your kind of impressions, and what stood out to you from the video? Yeah, no, I absolutely can relate to how, um, aside from you know all of the challenges he was facing. I mean, having to deal with HIV and having to deal with him losing his friends and uh, partners to HIV. Aside from that, I can relate that it's um it's very very refreshing to see um people in the lgbtq plus community um especially people of color who um use art to express their sexuality um mm -hmm. and i think that is something more of that we need because even um you know even though <clears throat> even though uh you know not everyone is a painter or a singer or a dancer you know it is very very inspiring and i think art um in this case is really beautiful uh to express mm -hmm. his experiences and like how he was painting his partners and his friends and people that he's lost hiv um is really moving and touching and just inspiring and i think um it you know pushes the idea that um you know to other um you know i'm pretty sure like gay it pushes to uh, the gay Latino community that, hey, you're not alone. And this is what I've gone mm. through in my experiences. And you know what I mean? So I think, um, I think Joey's art and his, um, his inspiration for using it to express his experiences and his, um, and his personal just uh, overview of being a gay Latino man um, is absolutely wonderful. I love his story and i like how he uses it to curate inspiration um for other people and uh and just getting the message um of you know hiv awareness um so mm -hmm. yeah i think that was just really touching for sure um i actually got the the chance to meet joey in person um they're here in mm -hmm. los angeles there's a, a place called la plaza and it is a, a latinx cultural museum um, and they feature some mm. really great exhibits from time to time. And some of Joey's work was featured. And just what you said, I mean, um, him being this this pioneer, this this artist that's representing his queer identity, his HIV positive identity through his work, um, all of the young artists that were there kind of flocked to him and they wanted to hear his inspiration and hear his words of advice and learn from him because they saw themselves reflected in the someone in someone that had come before them. It was, it was really cool to see. Um, Joey in the video mentions that one of his uh, kind of inspirations was uh, David Bowie. Um, Nandi, who mm -hmm. is someone maybe from the queer artist community that inspires you? Um, I would say, um, I think I would say, I would say Lena Waithe. I think I've, I think we've discussed this previously but i would say lena waith because um i mostly resonate with her because not only is she a black lesbian but she's androgynous and i think androgyny mm. is often you know like you know it's 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 like the stereotype um it's such a big stereotype and i like how she still expresses like that she does have femininity and just because she's androgynous that like mm. she doesn't have to be like she does her gender expression doesn't have to be like tomboyish or it doesn't have to fall into the stereotypes of like studs or just androgynous lesbian women of color and i think that's someone i look up to because she's had so many accolades and accomplishments in her career as um mm -hmm. as a writer um as just a filmmaker and and she won an emmy so i think that's pretty cool um <laughs> but when she did win that emmy i was like wow like someone who is has the same identity as me is able to you know do these wonderful things and make these um you know, have these amazing accomplishments and doing it openly and publicly um mm -hmm. I think it was just really touching to me. So I look up to Lena Waithe and luckily I was able to meet her um, a couple oh, wow. of years ago, which or a little over, yeah, a little over a year ago, which was awesome. And the so one thing cool. she told me is, uh, the one thing she told me was that, you know, 
there are not a lot of people like us who are in this industry. So be the person who like, mm. be the person who you can inspire, like be the person so that you can inspire other people who look like us and who are like us and have our identities to do that. And, you know, be that trailblazer and do it for them. You know what I mean? Not only right. because it's your passion, but do it for them um, so that people are, you know, equally represented. Um, mm. So yeah, I think Lena Waithe would be my inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, um, I think uh, Joey said that at the beginning of the video, he said there weren't, there weren't Latino people on TV. There weren't gay people and there certainly weren't Latino and gay people. So I had to paint myself, right? Like you have to be your own trailblazer sometimes. Um, Sam, what yeah. about you? Who is maybe an LGBTQ icon or celebrity or trailblazer that you admire and look up to? Uh, for starters, that was beautifully put, Nandi. <laughs> it really Thank was. Thank you. <laughs> um, someone I, an icon, probably besides but, Harvey Milk himself, I would have to say mm. is my mentor, uh, TJ. Mm. He's just been a huge help as a transgender man and just walking me through the process of moving into the adult world as a transgender man mm -hmm. and just what you're feeling is normal during college, the fear of never finding love mm. and just walking me through the uh, later processes of um, hormone mm -hmm. imbalances. <laughs> I'm so glad that you've had someone like TJ there to kind of walk you through it. I, I love that. So whether it's a celebrity, whether it's a person right there in your, in your personal life, um, it, it means the world. It means the world to see someone like you and to see them succeeding and seeing them be able to, to give back. It just, there's nothing quite like it. And it, it, it helps. I know as, as when I was younger, it was what helped me keep going. And all the, the queer youth that I get to talk to, just like you all say the same thing, that seeing someone like yourself really succeeding and, and, and paving the way, it, it, it's priceless for sure. Um, we have some prepared questions for, for Joey's story. Um, the first one is uh, Joey and his friends cho chose to make and wear t-shirts displaying the very slurs that were commonly used against them. Those shirts ended up being a hit among their community. Why do you think that is? And what value might people glean from reclaiming words originally intended uh, to hurt them? Um, Nandi, would you, would you like to share on this one? Do you have a thought on that, sure, that question? Sure, absolutely. Well, um, I think, you know, gay people have reclaimed the word que queer. And now mm -hmm. it's like, you know, in modern day, it's, it's a sexuality, you know what I mean? Queer mm -hmm. used to be an offensive term that was, it was used in a derogatory fashion to, um, to bash or discriminate against uh, LGBTQ people. But now, you know, when you talk about the spectrum of LGBTQ plus sexualities, um, queer is a part of that spectrum. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's just fascinating to see how um, marginalized communities uh, take those words that have been used to put us down and have been used to prevent us from being able to openly be ourselves and transform that into something powerful and transform that mm -hmm. into something uh, inspiring and moving. Um, I mean, it's the same thing with a lot. I think a lot of marginalized communities uh, have those, you know, those buzzwords that, uh, you know, kind of put people in shock when you use it. But when we use it with each other, you know, there's mm -hmm. a different meaning and there's so much greater uh, movement behind that. Um, I mean, with black people, you know, the N word was used in the derogatory way and still is unfortunately um, by, uh, by white people and people who had higher privilege than us and it was used to put us down and now it's used as a form of endearment and it's used um, amongst black people as a way to bring us up and the same thing with um, 
the Latinx community, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say the terms obviously, but there are terms in the Latinx community that they use to um, as a form of endearment. Um, there's you know it's it's pretty universal uh, mm -hmm. how marginalized communities and different communities who experience discrimination take those terms and transform them into something powerful and something meaningful. Um, right. So yeah, I think it's it's pretty prevalent absolutely for mm. communities who have to go through um those setbacks and discrimination to use those terms and flip them into sure. something powerful and i love what you did there nandi i sometimes people think that because um, people that have been oppressed use certain words that it's okay for them to use them too um, and even though you are part mm -hmm. of the queer community there are certain words that are not for you and just like there are certain right. words that are not for me based on my race or my gender or whatever it may be and there are still people in this world that that have trouble with that they think well if they can use the word then i can use the word and mm -hmm. it's more than that it's it's about understanding again the history of that word understanding why somebody would reclaim it and respecting that decision and allowing it to be someone else's word allowing it to be something for them um, there's a lot of, right. of beauty and a lot of love, I think, that goes into understanding words and, and why people choose to use them. Um, Sam, this, this next question, I think, could, could go to you, this question number two, is that Joey mentions that he and the other queer teens around him in the 80s often discussed whether or not they thought of themselves as mentally ill. Why do you think that was such a prevalent topic of conversation for them? with the time period being different this was several decades ago um, right that being lgbtq was seen as something different it, it wasn't something that was discussed or talked about and if it was it was used in a negative something is wrong with you mm -hmm. sort of fashion which i've heard many trans elders or just trans adults who transitioned or came out at that time and said oh people told me that there was something wrong with me that i was sick or just how i felt about myself or how uh the way i loved another person just because they were mm. the, of the same gender, that that wasn't okay. Obviously, mm -hmm. versus now, it's it's celebrated and honored and loved. One hundred percent. It breaks my heart hearing Joey say that that's that was a prevalent, not just like an every now and again question. No, that was like a prevalent piece of, of conversation for them. And it was definitely, I'm of the generation maybe in between the two, in between Joey, between you and, and, and Nandi. Um, but in my generation, certainly while I was closeted, certainly while I was grappling and questioning things in my mind, this question came up time and time again. But once I came out, because communities were already thriving, because there were people already there waiting to embrace me and love me, I quickly tossed that question to the side. And I quickly realized mm -hmm. that queer people aren't inherently, uh, or, or don't just naturally have uh, mental illness. It's that we often experience a lot of mental anguish because of the way people treat us due to our identities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important factor for people outside of the queer community to understand. Um, that's sure that within the queer community, there can be high rates of self-harm, high rates of drug and alcohol abuse, um, lots of different issues, but it's not because we're queer that those issues exist. It's because of how we're treated because we're queer. And if we want to solve those problems, we can start by loving and accepting people for, for who they are. Thank you so much for, for, for those thoughts. We have one more story. Um, unfortunately, just for time's sake, we probably won't be able to follow it with any questions, but I do want to make sure that that we get the chance to experience this, this next story from Carolyn Weathers, um, who is an author and an activist, as well as a publisher from here in the Los Angeles area. Let's learn about her story. I've always been compelled to take apart 
and uh, whatever was happening. I think it's just deep-seated beliefs and a sense of fairness, sense of fairness um, to try to, you know, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take it anymore. And my sister, Brenda Weathers, uh, was two and a half years older than me. In 1957, uh, she got kicked out of Texas Women's University for being a lesbian. She was handcuffed, taken down to the police station, because you could be arrested. We were illegal. It was illegal to be gay. But she refused to repudiate her lesbianism. And she became my hero at that instance. 17 years old, 1957, a small town in Texas, and she was handcuffed, and she did not repudiate it. We never went through the personal angst that so many do. We had the support of our parents, so that, I'm sure, helped us both without our even thinking about it very much. It was the time, just compelled, urged, drawn to this, to the movement. Um, so my sister and our lovers and I joined the Gay Liberation Front. Homosexuals who acknowledge their homosexuality and pattern their lives accordingly are known as gay. And the gay liberation movement is challenging a society that abhors homosexuality. That's how I, I got into it. It just seemed natural. And immediately we got into the, the Biltmore invasion. It was about 30 men, 10 women. Um, a British psychologist named Dr. Philip Feldman was doing um, shock aversion therapy to cure homosexuals. We were on the list of mental illnesses at that time. And they were having a convention at the Biltmore Hotel. And he was one of the honored guests. And he was showing his film. And it showed a, a young man, a young gay man, who was being treated. And it would flash on the screen a picture of a lovely young woman. No shock. And then it would flash on the screen a really handsome young man bzz, bzz, and shock him. And this is supposed to change him from being gay. And we were there specifically to protest this and not let the show go on. And one of our numbers stood up in the audience and said, are we going to stand for this shit? And we all stood up and said, hell no. And we got up and we stormed the stage and refused to let him show that film. In fact, made him sit down and listen to us for a change. So that was the film. Oh, and it was, I think, two years later. They decided we were insane after all. They took us out. We weren't crazy after all. Thank you. So that's what that was the film. For me, it led into uh, writings. There was just so much going on now in the small presses. Again, because of what had started back in 1970. So here was now the, the literary scene. And I got heavily involved in that. And my partner, Jenny Wren, and I started a lesbian publishing company, uh, Clothespin Beaver Press. We won awards. This was the heyday of the small press and the independent bookstore. Well, I'm, I'm just so happy that there, that it has changed, that it's so, I, this sounds so condescending to say it's so much better, because they, they still have to go through so many terrible things, maybe in the small towns particularly, the ostracism, the unfairness, the bullying, it's, 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 we're only, we still can't get married in all the states, there's so much still to do. I just say, stick to your guns, be happy, there is nothing wrong with you. I'm honored to have been part of the the pioneer generation to get it going and I, I would just say to the, the kids uh, you can pick up the reins because there's still so much more to go and you can do it and be proud. Ugh, another great, great, great video. Um, 
I would love your impressions of this video and maybe your your final impressions just about talking through some of these these great stories. Um, Sam, would you like to start? What was what was something that stood out to you from from that video? Well, obviously, when she cursed, that was quite amusing. <laughs> but just her undying ambition to stand up for others who were like her and going against conversion therapy mm -hmm. and just saying, this is not okay. This is why. And she never stopped for one second. And just, I feel like her voice and spirit just spread throughout the community and brought allies and brought maybe perhaps other people out of the closet and joined her cause and just mm -hmm. made this movement so much more powerful. For sure. Nandi, what do you think? Well, um, as a lesbian, uh, <laughs> that was really refreshing to see. Um, a lot of a lot of things have been refreshing to see today, but yes, that uh, video in particular um, was very very moving for me uh, because I think that lesbians are a little underrated in just like representation, um, and so I think like how she not only stood up for conversion therapy of gay men, you know, cause like, you know, there was, I mean, I don't know if there was, you know, she didn't talk about conversion therapy um, happening to women. And I think it's just, it just goes to see how, or in that video, I'm pretty sure it has existed, but I just think it goes to show that women are so powerful, even when we stand up for other people, you know what I mean? Like we don't have to, mm -hmm. you know, be, feminist and then like not support gay men or not support another community you know what i mean and i think she really um went out there and was like no i'm not taking this anymore you're not going to do this to this gay guy because he doesn't deserve it and this is not right and for the fact that you know she did that and started a publishing company writing a memoir about uh what happened to her in texas and how her sister got kicked out um, it was literally arrested for presenting her sexuality, um, I think was um, just very important in, in uh, the, the gay liberation movement that followed in 1970 um, and speaking out about not only women's rights, but how lesbians and, um, you know, dykes or whatever have, you know, the freedom to express ourselves in any uh, in any way and i just think that um you know her writing that book and her standing up for um the lgbtq plus community um was very touching in the way that she did it she was very firm in it but there's there has to be a way to get it done <laughs> for sure for sure Agreed. um i've also had the amazing pleasure of meeting of meeting caroline and she she's a fireball and she's she's one mm. she's really fun to speak to and i couldn't be more grateful for for her story which is which leads me to the big takeaway from this entire live session today and the, the fact that we're all talking here today the big takeaway is that stories are really really important they really do matter mm. i i love this quote from michael morgan um, he, he says that I think the moral argument is self-evident. Stories matter. Stories affect how we live our lives, how we see other people, how we think about ourselves. Um, I couldn't agree more. If you are interested in learning more of the stories from the Fearless series, um, you can check out uh, our website. You can also download the EDU guide. It's an educational material that can help you walk through the, 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 the series with your classroom if you're an educator, with your kids if you're a parent, um, with your GSA group if you're a student leader. Um, you can go and download our guide uh, there um, to be able to, to explore more from the series. And while you're online, of course, go ahead and follow the It Gets Better project. Um, uh, you can pick your favorite platform where we, you can find us at It Gets Better. Um, and we're constantly publishing new stories and sharing new insights from people all over the globe who have something powerful to, to say. Um, I wanna thank both of you, uh, Nandi and Sam, for joining me today and for taking the time to watch these videos and discuss some really important and some, some intimate topics. 
Um, I also want to thank We Rise for giving us this chance to, to bring these stories to a bigger audience and to share our thoughts um, with a broader community. Um, you can check out more programming that We Rise is putting together for the rest of the month um, at uh, www.werise.la or check out, of course, their Facebook or Twitch or YouTube accounts to follow uh, any of their live events as they're happening. Um, again, thank you, Nandi and Sam. It's been such a pleasure. Um, I hope Thanks you have for having an amazing us. day. Thank you. Yes, of course. And in June, just in a few days, it's Pride Month. So happy Pride. Have an amazing, Woo amazing month. Happy Pride. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thanks.